Sleep. 
give him a praise this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you've brought us to this day and you've ushered us through these 21 days. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us a time of rest and a time of focus inward and upward. We thank you, Lord, that in that time you have taught us and you've shown us things. We thank you, Lord, that in that time you have protected us and connected us and helped us see things that we didn't see before. In that time, you've revealed yourself so that we can see you more clearly as we shut our minds down and our lives down just a little bit so that we could reach out to you, God. And we thank you, Lord, that you usher us forth and you raise us to newness in every part of our lives, God. Yes, we are the ones that are found. We are the ones that shout, not because we're scared, not because we're angry, but because we're joyous. Because we love God and we know that he's with us. And even in the midst of our trials, we shout out and we say, God, we're here and we know that you're there. God, we are found by you because you never lose us, because you never let us go. You never walk away from us, God. And even in the darkest night, we know that you carry the light and you bring it to us by revealing it in us. So God, today, as we just come out of this time of prayer and fasting, God, let the, let the joy of the Lord just cover us. Let the joy of the Lord just come and give us peace so that we can pass peace to others in a world that's upside down. God, we're standing right side up and we can see you clearly. So Lord, help us to worship you this morning. Help us to just connect with you and allow you to say and do what you want to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't deserve it No matter how hard I try I don't deserve it Still you provide Oh, I don't deserve it No matter how hard I try No, I don't deserve it Still you provide And if my life fades away And only suffering fill my days Then I pray, I proudly say That I let none of them go to I don't deserve you And all you supply I don't deserve you Still you I don't deserve you And all you supply I could never thank you But I can offer this life
I don't deserve you and all you supply I could never earn but I can offer this life You save me and brought me home. Your heart is close. You found me. Unconditionally, you love me before I could speak. You had plans for me.
give him the praise this morning because that is a true statement that our God is mighty and fighting for us. And you know, this isn't a moment to miss because if there was a big prayer on your heart, now's the time to confess that you've received it. If there was a place where you were this week or in the last three weeks where you were putting a big request before God, you need to understand that he hears, he cares, and he's capable. He hears you every time you pray. He cares beyond anyone else in your life. And he is capable of doing what you've asked him to do. So these moments just give us an opportunity to remember the prayers that we've laid before God and then say, God, I receive it in Jesus' name. And I don't know what prayers you had. It's not important that I know. It's important that you know that he knows. It's important that you know that God is the good father and he is the mighty king. Imagine that. He's both the good father and the mighty king. 
He's the good father, the one that's personal in your life. The one that loves you and can do better than any parent could ever do. And we've all had good parents. Some of us have had bad parents, but you know what? They all pale in comparison to the good father that we look to. They pale in, in comparison to who God the Father is. But not only is he personal, he's mighty, he's the mighty king. Now think about that. Because that makes us royalty. But I don't want you to be frivolous around that. I want you to understand that as a child of God, you have access to everything he has. As a child of God, you have the right to pray before the throne. As a child of God, you have the right to ask God for things that he has already committed into your life and the things that he said that it's, it's his will. You have the right to go before God and remind him of what he said. You have the right to go boldly before the throne of grace because you've been washed in the blood of Jesus. Can you say amen? You have the right to call him daddy. You have the right to see him as your father in this world and you leave behind the tribes you came from and you head toward the kingdom of God because that's who you really are. And when you have that right, you should use it. You should exercise it. You should exercise that right. You should believe that your prayers are heard and they are answered because God is able. Can you say amen? Your prayers are heard and they are answered because your God is able. And not only is he the good father, but he is the mighty king. So right now, I want you to I want you to, in your heart, by faith, receive the answers to the prayers that you had over these last three weeks. I'm just convinced that, uh, that each of us had a big prayer we were praying for. It's like, God, can you hear me? But we were begging him, and we shouldn't have. We shouldn't have begged him. And he's not mad at us for doing it, but he's saying, child, you don't understand. You don't understand. You didn't have to beg me. You didn't have to beg me. He is the good father. He's the good father. And he says, child, you didn't have to beg me. Because what you're asking for was on my heart anyway. Because I put the desire in your heart that you just had. Can you say amen? <laughs> because before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I knew you. You weren't an idea. I knew you. And because that's all true, you can come before me and boldly make a request of me. Because there's probably a pretty good probability that the request you're going to make, that desire of your heart, I've actually placed in your heart. So I think it's a, it's a moment to seal this prayer time we've had. You just believe you've received what you've prayed for. Anybody ready, for, ready to do that? Believe you've received by faith. Amen? And I'll lead us in prayer because I had a big prayer too. I'm like you. I'm no different. I had a big prayer and I had th something I was wrestling over and I was losing sleep over. It was like, God, can't you hear me? And man, it broke my heart when he said, do you think I not hear you? You think I can't hear you? And then when I begged and he said, please get up off your knees if you're going to beg. If you're going to worship me, that's one thing. But if you're going to beg me, that's not what I want. But if you're going to bow to me and submit to me, then stay on your knees, Steve. But get up if you're going to beg me. I don't want you to beg me. I'm your dad. I'm your dad. So let's pray and let's receive from God because I believe this prayer will also give you the ability to encourage other people. That that strength that God gives you will allow you to minister to other people and tell them, don't, don't despair. Your daddy hears you. You're his child. He wants to hear you. He wants you to come to him and ask him. Heavenly Father, we just pray and we receive you, God. We thank you for this time of prayer and fasting. However people were able to participate, Lord, we're not under the law or obligation. However they were willing and able to participate, God, we thank you for helping them participate. And in participating, they were participating with you, not with us. Although we did it together as a show of unity in our church, we know that we were all praying to you. We were all going before you. We were honoring you. We were giving glory to you. It wasn't about us. It was about you. So God, we know that you heard us. We know that you care about every prayer that we gave you. 
And the big ones, God, we know by faith that we've received it in the name of Jesus. And so right now, God, as we close this time, we ask you to seal it by faith with our heart of expectation, knowing that we have received the answers to our prayers. We'll be patient if we have to wait for it. But God, we apprehend it by faith, knowing that is the thing sometimes we can't see, that we just have to believe and know that you love us so much that you want to answer that prayer, God. So by faith, we receive it, and we do so in Jesus' name, and all who agree with that prayer said, come on, give him the glory this morning. Give him the glory. He is worthy of glory and honor and praise, and he is both the mighty king and our good father. Amen. I pray that you give us patience towards our family, even when it's hard. I pray that you help us show love and turn the other cheek, because family can be frustrating at times. And even though we are exiting this fast, I pray that we still pray like we have been. Lord, I ask that you touch the people who have been affected by COVID and heal them, because by your stripes, we are healed. I pray that others come to know you so that you, they may go to heaven and not be led astray. Lord, I hope you bless today and the days to come. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this time of prayer, fasting, and worship. We thank you for the freedom to exercise our faith and share the knowledge of your love. As our fast is coming to an end, we thank you for the ability to endure the things we gave up for a time period. I ask, Lord, that through this process, we have created anchor points that we can reflect on during future challenges and struggles. I pray that like Daniel, we would have a purposed heart to obey God. I ask that in the midst of our challenges, you would give us strength to stand firmly on the narrow path of obedience. I pray as we fasted, you stirred within us a desire to see your vision fulfilled. Thank you, Lord, for holding me through all of my shortcomings and challenging life circumstances. Thank you for giving me patience and passion to remain faithful through all circumstances, challenges, and life changes. May the momentum from this fast propel us into the next steps we have designed for our journey, both collectively and individual. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, let's give God a praise this morning. Say hallelujah. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Everybody's hungry now, right? Did, it, did anybody eat yet this, today? Just if they were not eating, did anybody eat today yet? No? Wow, you guys are awesome. Praise God. So everybody's going to run out of here very early before church is over because we got to go get lunch, right? Amen. Well, you know, we just wanted to take a moment. One of the things that I love to do because I, I'm okay hearing myself talk a lot, but there's times when I want to hear other people talk more than me. So uh, we, we do this. This is called On the Couch, where we just have an opportunity where we'll take some time and we'll just hear from other people. And, uh, and in particular, all the people out there in, uh, in, in YouTube land and Facebook land, we want to welcome you again. If you couldn't make it this morning, praise God. We're still talking to you. We know you're out there. And we want you to connect with us. So stay with us today and just enjoy what God has because this is Vision Sunday. And we're just going to take a little bit more time to talk about what God's been talking to us about. You should expect that through a time of prayer and fasting, things were bubbling up. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. That there are just things that bubble up that you wouldn't have gotten if you had just been in your normal lifestyle. And so hopefully you remember that as we go through this year in particular. And remember, there's times you got to slow down and be quiet in order for the Lord to speak to you and then give you directions for the next step. But so the first person we're going to have up is Anna, if you would just come up. And uh, we're, just gonna, we're just gonna talk about sort of our experience with the fast. Excuse me, Taryn, I'm sorry. You're the same, you're the same. It's the same family, it was close. No, I, it, well now you are. <laughs> Praise God, hallelujah. Taryn has joined us and uh, yeah, thank you. Praise God, and I apologize for that. 
That's okay. Praise Everybody God. Everybody thinks I'm like her anyway. You so. guys are alike, so <laughs> I mean, so I can mix, mix you up a little bit, right? <laughs> Praise God. So it's good. Thank you for coming up. Um, we're just going to take some time, and I just wanted to get your perspective on, you know, sort of going the distance with, with the fast. I mean, it was 21 days, and, and, and we don't expect everybody to go through the whole thing. Praise God. But it was an opportunity to do something that was on your heart. So how did it go for you? So I started off really good. Um, I was really excited for kind of another reason to help motivate me to read my Bible every day because that's something I struggle with. Um, I don't know. I just always have a hard time okay. with that. Um, so I really liked that, and I thought the stories that we were reading in the chapters were really good. I love um, the story of Joseph and yeah, no. his coat and his brothers. I had recently just watched the uh, DreamWorks movie of that, so okay. I was like, oh, now I get to read the story. So that was cool. <laughs> And then one of my faults in kind of falling off about halfway is that I would wait until the end of the night to read because I liked reading before I went to sleep and praying kind of as I fell asleep. Yep. It's just always peaceful for me. But in that, I kind of forgot one night and then it turned into several nights and then I was like, oh, it's over. Whoops. Aww. So I'm going to try and get back into it. But I did stay with... Um, fasting the things that I had decided to keep off of, awesome. which was social media, because awesome. it takes a lot of hours of my day just scrolling for no reason. Yeah. Um, Nobody else does that, right? <laughs> it's just you. It's just me. Okay. Absolutely. But um, so I found myself a lot less stressed in the past three awesome. weeks just staying off of those platforms. Um, you know, not seeing any of the political mess that's going on or seeing what friends are posting about COVID or any of the race, and it's been really nice not to be a part of that for the past three weeks. Good. And I've noticed with the extra time trying to find stuff to do, I had a spike in creativity. I've been drawing awesome. a lot recently, making some fun wax seal um, letters to send friends in the mail. So Praise God. I've really enjoyed having that extra time, and I didn't realize how much time I wasted on social isn't, media. Isn't that the truth? I mean, and it's funny because fasts are like that. You don't realize how much time you spend eating, preparing to eat, um, recovering from eating, you know, cleaning up from eating. I mean, I mean, it's a process. I mean, there's hours associated with it. So you're right. Those things that we consume really take, consume us at the same time. Absolutely. Good. So what would you do, say, to encourage people? Because there's an opportunity for you to be condemned, right? Wasn't there an opportunity for the devil to say, oh, see, you failed again. You can't read that Bible yet, you know? Um, just even if you do fail and miss out, which I did and I noticed, um, I should have gotten back to reading when I noticed, oh, no, it's been a few days. And I just was like, oh, well, it's been a few days. I'm just going to yeah. not. And... I really want to be an encouragement of, you know, it's okay if you fail yes. because we're never going to learn unless we make those mistakes Amen. and learn from them, obviously. Um, and it's always okay to fail and then get back and go to what Amen. you're doing. And that's what I'm going to work Amen. on doing myself. Isn't that awesome? I was sharing with, because I think it, it is a secret. One of the secrets to reading the Bible is let the Bible read to you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I know some Christians are like, well, that's not legal. You can't do that. I'm supposed to read the Bible. They can't read to me. I got news for you. Okay, so full disclosure. I actually was doing even, even more of that this time. But what I found would happen was I'd sit and do work in front of my computer so it was available, right? So my Bible app was sitting right there. I would go through like five days worth of stuff, you know, the Bible just reading it itself to me. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it sort of removed that judgment and that condemnation of you can still take in the Word of God and get familiar with it, and it's a good thing. Just like social media, if you listen to a song long enough, you memorize it. Guess what? You listen to the Bible long enough, you'll memorize it. Somebody say amen. And it is okay. It's, it's good. It's, I would rather you get it in you that way than not get it in you. And so just be encouraged that when you fall off. And the other thing I'd encourage for the, the one-year Bible, the first time I did it, I didn't go all the way through I mean, I stopped partway through, stuff, life happened, I didn't all, you know, I, I'd stop. But the good, the good news was, if I did it the next year, I can go further. And if I did it the next year, I can go further. And eventually, through that practice, to your point, 
it actually allowed me to complete it, and then I got my gold star. And then I went back and I kept completing it. So yeah, that's such a great message, especially for young people, because again, I, I think it is hard to read the Bible, but there are tools out there that can help you get comfortable with it and make it work for you. Amen? So anything else you would, you would just share from your experience? Did God tell you anything special during that time? Um, I guess the word he always gives me is to be patient because I'm okay. a very impatient person. Okay. I like it to be now, and that's not usually God's way, Okay. at least not for me. So um, just really to be patient because I'd really like to start on a lot of projects like now, right now, like school and a job and love life but mm. it's just not in his timing and i have a struggle with waiting for that but okay. one thing i have learned over my errors is that my time is never the right time amen but it's always worth it to wait for his time because it's always way better than you could ever think it would be hey, amen to that how many of you said hallelujah? hallelujah amen was she better around the house during this time or was she grumpy what's that more peaceful. So you're, you're confirming that, yeah, that really did do something spiritually for you. Amen. That, that was a true confession. They had the opportunity to, to get you, and they didn't, so they're <laughs> going to take you home, right? <laughs> and everything will be good, right? Praise God. All right, thank you for coming up and being brave. Give her a, a hand. Taryn. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right, and the next person we'd like to have come up is Gail Johnson. I got your name right. <laughs> See, you can, always, you can always ding the MC, right? It's like, why do these guys, you know, they can't get it right. Sorry you didn't get my name right. I my didn't. No, you're not, Barbara. <laughs> I don't believe it even for a second. That's funny. Praise the Lord. You're just an awesome person. I always say that about you because, because you are and because, um, no, you... <laughs> Are you going to give me some? I mean, <laughs> we can arrange that. I know who your uh, manager is. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. Praise God. No, it's good. She's just such a warm person. I just love hanging around with her. And uh, so that's why I'm always encouraged to just have her just share. Yeah. So tell me about it. Was it. What is it, a challenge for you, these 21 days? How did it yeah, go? Yeah, it was. Grab the, oh, sorry. That's okay. It was a challenge. It's like I, I fast all the time. I fast probably twice a month Good. for the past year or more. Okay. I couldn't do it this time. Oh, wow. <laughs> Interesting. So tell me about that. Uh, you know, I get maybe one that. day, maybe two days. And, and about halfway through, uh, the Lord starts speaking to me about going the distance and what that really meant for mm. me. Led me to scriptures that I'm going to give you, so get your pencils and pens out because I want, you, to, I want you, to got, you guys to get this. The first one he gave me was um, Hebrews 13.5. Starts out this, the, the verse talking about do not be lovers of money. You know, I didn't relate to that too much because I don't have any, can't love it. But um, the last part of it, where he says three times, I will never leave you. Mm. I will never forsake you. Amen. No, no, never. Because I was telling pastor and the leadership team, this has probably been, and I'm not going to talk very much because I'll start okay, crying, one of the hardest years of my life mm. where I felt like I messed up, and I don't know where I, where I messed up at. And so he starts walking me back over the last year of my life and looking at what he's done in my life, and it just blew me away. Just absolutely blew me away. So I'm just backing into his words. And, and Mike will tell you, I used to go to the one-year Bible class. I was the one. I'm behind. I'm behind. I think I'm like a chapter or two behind. And Mike and... <laughs> Are you shocked? <laughs> <laughs> and, and him and Jeff would be like, oh, well, you know, just we'll talk to each other. You know, she's always behind. You know, she'll never catch up kind of Goodness. stuff. You know, and it was a running joke. And so now it's like over the past year or maybe longer, I can't take my eyes out of the Bible. Yeah. I can't get out of it. They tease me. It's like, look at this Bible. It's all they highlighted up. They tease you? Stop What are you it. reading? The, the part that's <laughs> not highlighted? Or what, what is this? You know, writing your own Bible? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Because what he started to taking me through this past month was taking me to all the scriptures to hook onto that one scripture about I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, and causing me to remember how he's been there for me through that past year, every step of the way. Amen. Every step of the way. Things that I thought I would never be able to do, people I thought I would never be able to face. He said, if you just take a step and believe me, you'll be okay. And I was. Amen. And I was. And so I could take two more steps and three more steps. Reading this Bible, it's like, oh my gosh. So here are the other scriptures I, I really feel that he gave me that were close to my heart that he wanted me to share with you. And one of them is in Luke about the prodigal, Luke 15. The particular scripture I believe is 31 that just absolutely slays me. He says to the son that was, you know, really complaining about the party that his brother got because he came back and he's found. He says, son, you have always been with me. You have always been with me. And everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. That just absolutely lays me out. Because I never saw myself that way. Yeah. Two more and then I'll do, I'm done. Um, Jeremiah, I'm not sure if it's 31 or 32, but I think 31.3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. So I was like, oh my gosh, that's another one. And then the other one that talks about holiness and, and how, you know, I'm, a, I'm an achiever, so I, I want to do it myself. And that, that scripture in Romans about how the Jews learned the law so they could get something, gain something to, you know, that they could do themselves to provide their own salvation, you know, to, to make it on their own. That's me. That thing, that, that's what that stuck with me. And then I'm reading Jeremiah. So I'm like, I can't even believe I'm right way back here in Jeremiah again. So, um, the, and, and I can't read all of it, but it talks about how um, he will burn his laws in our hearts. So we will not forget them. So going to the distance to me means going the distance with him. Amen. And following him. Amen. Yeah. That's good. That's it. That's good. Did he give you anything specific for this year? Just curious. Did you feel like you came out of that time of prayer and fasting with, uh, okay, God, I see something. It's almost like a star that rises that's brighter than the other ones. A lot ones. of stuff. Okay. In progress. Yeah. Um, but the main things were the scriptures that I gave. Okay. Okay. So they're all centered around those yeah. four. Got yeah. It. Because I, I was so focused okay. on, I messed up. Yeah, yeah. I messed up. So that was personal. It was yeah. like, no, here's what you need to hear from me. Yeah. In order to make it to this next, yes. this next part of the journey. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Amen. Me and him. Hallelujah. Yeah, works for me. Hallelujah. Let's Amen. give her a hand. Thank you. Amen. God bless you. What makes a champion? What makes a man or a woman want to achieve the impossible? Is it a dream they have? A hurt that they're trying to heal, or a doubt they want to overcome? What makes a championship? Is it the team or the equipment? The logo or the coach? What makes a group of people want to accomplish great things together? We ask these questions because we all love champions, whether we see ourselves as contestants or not. We love engaging in the contest and winning. Every champion first dreams of winning. Every challenger dreams of victory. Victory is the goal and the ones who win can see themselves crossing the finish line first. In order to win, the champion must train. The champion must prepare. The champion must count the cost. The champion must surround themselves with people who encourage him. The walk of faith is the very same, and we all have a race to win. How do we know? The Bible tells us so in the book of Hebrews. 
Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lie aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand at the throne of God. God wants to prepare us all to go the distance. His desire is to see us win the race, take the crown, feel the power of overcoming, the joy of defeating challenges. Together, we can do more than we ever imagined. And as we succeed, all of heaven cheers us on. Get ready, get set, get going, get results. God wants to see us victorious. Amen. Come on, give it a cheer. Hallelujah. Woo! All of those things are true. God wants to see us win. He wants us to be champions. He wants us to train hard so that we can actually make it through it. He wants to give us endurance. He wants to give us a focus in our lives. He wants to get all of those things lined up just like any other champion. And you have to understand that this is why going the distance can be so important in our lives because you remember Scripture repeatedly says that you can miss it if you want to. You know, somebody else can get the, the, the fruit of your plantings. If you don't wait long enough for the crop to come up, someone else can actually get the corn that you actually put in the ground. Can anybody say amen? So there is always a challenge of going the distance with God and being patient with God. It's related to that. It's, you go the distance because that's the patience you need to have. The endurance to be able to make it through a very difficult time in your life or even to achieve something great that God has given you. Because I'm convinced that even coming out of this period of time, that we should have big goals that God gave us. There's, there's likely in your life, I'm not going to say everybody, but it's likely in your life at this point that you got something big from God through that period of time. Yes, yes. And it's bigger than you. It's going to take more than an overnight. It's going to require a little bit more effort and focus and practice and discipline. I mean, it's going to take something out of you because God wants to give something to you. And if you've got one of those, this is a great time for you. Because one of the things that we want to do, and this is why you've got a book from us, and it's really a journal, and the journal is going to carry you through the entire year. We want to do this both together and consistently through the year. And I'll describe it as I walk through the message today because I want us to do this. Again, this is one of those places where we get to do this together. Now, one of the advantages of doing it together is every so often we get to check in with each other and say, how you doing with that? How's that going? What, what have you learned about where God wants to take you? I mean, I fully expect that when God gives us goals and challenges and vision, he wants us to write it down, make it plain, so that they that see it can run with it. Can you say amen? And so this is why, and again, I'll go back to this as we go through it, make sure everybody's got one. But let's talk about why going the distance in particular is such an important thing. And I will start with where is the body of Christ today? Because the body of Christ is in some interesting um, places and positions, and it's trying to figure out what it is and what it should be doing. How many of you would agree with that? I, I think there's just a lot of the Christians and churches and pastors trying to figure out, so where are we going with this, right? And we've gone through a year that beats all other years. I believe this year, if we close last year properly, this year can be a banner year because you're going to take it and look at it differently. And the way you take it and look at it differently is you get on God's agenda. Can you say amen? You figure out what was it that God wants you to learn from last year, and then you close it out so that you can get ready to learn what's up for this year. And so many of us have to sort of let go of some stuff that happened last year. We got we to gotta dig through the muck and find the diamond in the middle of all of that. We have to thank God regardless of what happened last year. Can anybody say amen? And we got to remember, just as you shared, that, you know what, God's been with us the whole time. Is God still on the throne? Is he still with us? Does he still want us to come together and worship him? Does he want us to be thankful? 
Does he want us to enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving? Does he want us to continue to pray for his will to be done in this world? That is the centering that the church now, because of the shaking, has to go through. And the only way you get through that is you pray and you fast. Anybody say amen to that? Uh, you, don't, you don't strive. You don't, you don't argue. You don't debate. You know, there's a time for that. But the time for that is, is after you've prepared. And so we're heading into a new year. Now is a great time to sort of step back and sort of pray and listen to God and figure out where everything is so you can move forward. And I think that is the right place for the body of Christ to be. I believe the challenges coming forward are bigger than the ones from last year. I think they are. I think last year set up for the challenges to be a little bit higher. Now, when God takes you from grace to grace, you go from glory to glory. So in other words, you rise with God as he puts challenges and he allows certain things to happen. It's not to tear us down. Actually, he's trying to build some muscles in the body of Christ. Have you figured that out yet? He's trying to build unity in the body of Christ. Now, he is not causing the things that are happening. He is allowing the things that are happening. But he, in the midst of those things happening, God has a plan for the body of Christ. God has a plan for each and every one of you, and he has a plan for the body of Christ. And we have to get both agendas. Can you say amen? amen. And once we have both agendas, we can commit to them, and actually we can come together and figure out where the commonality is. Hey, I heard that too, that we need to be more active in this nation about understanding the politics of this nation. Ooh. You're darn right it's true. If we do not have impact and influence on the moral direction of this country, let me tell you something, it will go to, I can't say that. It absolutely will. So, I, we, many of us don't like politics because of what we've experienced, but I got news for you. If we're going to be strategic in terms of understanding where God's going, we need to pay attention. And more importantly, we need to pay attention together. Can you say amen? together. We need to be wise as serpents, but yet gentle as doves. Well, you don't get to leave the, the wise part of it behind. We have to be wiser than we've been because God wants to take us somewhere we've never been. And in order to do that, we're going to have to do that together. It's a requirement. But this is why we have to sort of see where the body of Christ is today and let God guide us into the new place that he wants it to be. But let's read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. It says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God and the Holy Spirit. I just told you that. God is building something, and he's building it on you and us. He's building it on you and us. He's telling you that he's building his body, his church. It is a living building. The chief cornerstone is Jesus, Jesus himself. It's his church. There are times that I've prayed, and I've said, God, you need to take this church because it ain't my church. It's your church. And you should be saying, Pastor, that was a good thing to do. Because that's the way this church moves where God wants it to go. It ain't because I'm so smart. It's because he's wise. Amen. And so he should be at the helm. Actually, he should be at the helm of your life too. Remember how this goes. This is a little bit of both, right? This is both you and us. It is not separate. We have to stop being lone rangers in the things of God because we can't do all that we think we can. And we need somebody that can guide us and guard us. There's times your brothers need to pull you out of the fire. Somebody say amen. amen. And they need to know that you're in the fire in order to pull you out. They need, you can't walk it alone. You shouldn't walk it alone. Can you say hallelujah? It, it, ain't, it, ain't, it ain't possible alone. And some of us are figuring that out. And we're like, yeah, but I don't like the church people. Well, too bad. <laughs> you're a church people. <laughs> Right? It's the same thing. It's like, well, I, every church I go to is a mess. Well, that's because you showed up, probably. <laughs> it's like, who, what was the common denominator in all the churches being a mess that you showed up to? Oh, uh -huh. yeah, you. I don't know if it's the church. I think it may be you because that's the common denominator. This is the way we have to see things. We have to say to ourselves, look, let's be humble about our interaction with other believers and let's understand what God's plan is for all of us. 
Man, I'll tell you. And that's what it's all for. The the amazing thing about the Word of God, it's all set up to help us deal with all that. Offense, unforgiveness, anger, hatred, you know, division. you got to be kidding me. If you start looking for the solutions to those things, this is why I have no confidence in the world. I got no confidence that that the world is going to fix racism. And you shouldn't either. There's only one way you fix these things. It's called Jesus Christ and him alone. Now, we can paper over it. We can say we're going to fix our politics with, with a, a political action committee. I got a political action committee for you. Amen. I got one. It's called the body of Christ. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. You want a winning strategy? You know what it starts with? It starts with God and the gospel. Every winning strategy starts with God and the gospel. And when we understand that and we actually operate it, we will win every battle. Now, even the battles we don't win, we'll learn something. Come on. I've watched, you you read the Bible, it's like, okay, those guys were supposed to go into the promised land. You know that, right? Do you know God's perfect will was for the Israelites to go into the promised land, but they didn't go? Did God leave? Did he change his plan? Was he willing to correct them? Did he make a way from them anyway? Was the popular, was the popular um, decision the right one? If you think God's about failing, you don't know God. Everything man does, God has an alternate plan that, that confounds man's plans. Is that the Bible you're reading? Many are the plans that a man's heart are in men's hearts, but God's will is done. So the winning plan is what? It's God's will. And so we have to apprehend that. Can you say amen? amen. We got to apprehend that. And then we have to get strategic about winning in this su- supernatural spiritual battle that we are engaged in. America, and I've said it before, America is under spiritual attack. Well, don't just talk about it. Do something. Don't just talk about, yeah, I can see that. Everybody can see that. It's all over all the media, all the issues that we got. But I haven't heard many people talking about, so what are we supposed to do about it as the body of Christ? One of the things we got to do is come together. The other thing we got to do is get on God's agenda. And so there's a path that God wants to take us forward with. And so we're getting started together because we're supposed to be moving forward together. Again, it's not something we're supposed to be doing alone. There are people in here that should be praying, and there's probably two or three of them that should be praying strategically. Not everybody. Somebody say amen. Because some of y'all be like, I'm going to fall asleep if we start praying. Some of y'all be like, no, I don't, I don't know how to pray. I don't want to pray. Okay. That the, the role of strategic prayer leaders and warriors is a select group. We don't all have to do the same thing. You figure that out? Any homes here where everybody does everything? Like, like the husbands and wives, we all do everything. What typically happens in a home? We specialize. You start doing what you do. You do it because functionally you're probably best at it. Somebody say amen. But when you do it together and everybody does their part, guess what happens? Everything works. It's the same thing in the body of Christ. It's a simple example of how if we would do what we're called to do and, and made to do, everything works out. Please say amen. And so I use the example of some people need to be strategically praying, not praying for needs, but strategically praying for where this country is going and what the spiritual tenor is and the strongholds are so that we can tear them down. Nobody said amen. I'm just giving you an example. There are things missing here. The body is not functioning all the way, but this is why we might have to step it up. Amen? And we're supposed to do it together. Acts 17, chapter 17, verse 24. The God who made the world and all the things in it, never forget that, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and, thing, and, and all things. See, God is the one that causes us to move. To live and move and have our being. That's the way you've heard that in the King James. But it is God who then coordinates and gets us to move together. It is the one-heartedness. I had that conversation with somebody this week. And I said, what we're missing is we think we're supposed to be one-headed. Well, we do have one head, and his name is Jesus Christ. 
And we do have the mind of Christ, but we don't always apprehend it the same. What's going to guide us is the one-heartedness of the church. In other words, we are pursuing God together and we are following, right? He's, his eyes roam to and fro, seeking those whose hearts are perfect toward him. God is looking for people who can be one-hearted with him and with one another. Can you say amen? And then he will impart, he will impart to that group a, a unique set of skills and gifts to actually accomplish his work. That's what we see. And if we believe that, then that is one of the compelling reasons why the church has to come together. Everybody okay with that? The church has to move together. And this is another reason why the division in the world will neutralize the church just like it neutralizes the world. And so, yeah, our politics can't work right now. It, it's, it's, it's not going to be effective. Somebody say amen. You're going to watch a lot of dysfunction, guys. And it's because of the lack of a spiritual connection and one-heartedness in our nation's government. That's what I believe is going to happen. And you can't be, you know, it's not one or the other. It, at some point, we got to realize all the people that voted different than I voted, I get to live with their choice. We're in this together. This is why I would challenge people to say, don't tell other people to shut up. Half this nation went the other way. You don't tell them to shut up. Maybe you should listen a little bit more because they might have warned you of some stuff. Can anybody say man? And vice versa. I'm not saying it's one-sided. It doesn't need to be one-sided. Matter of fact, we should, be two, we should be together so that we actually get the benefit of being together. We get the benefit of those different gifts and perspectives, and that is what God wants. Can somebody say man? God wants us together. Even though we're different, God wanted man, male and female together, all, even though they were opposites in many ways. God knows how to fix that, and he wants us to figure out how to do that one-hearted dance. There's a one-hearted dance that the body of Christ needs to be able to do. And no, we shouldn't be at each other's throats because we're in one kingdom. Somebody say amen. You, one kingdom can't say, you know, a divided kingdom won't work. It just will fail. And so if you're interested in the body of Christ winning in this world, in this nation, yeah, 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 raise your hand. And that means we have to be together. Can you say amen? amen. And yes, we're going to have to have hard debates, and we're going to have to pick the times and the places, and we're going to have to get over our emotional things. And you know what? We're just going to have to get wiser because we don't know. If, I, I find there's a lot of misinformation out there, and people are lacking knowledge. Well, the only way to solve that is for us to have a conversation. And he made from one every nation, from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. I love this because he's telling you every, every kind of person on the planet was God's idea. So the fact that the Africans live in Africa, whose idea was that? How about the Chinese living in China? Whose idea was that? How about the Indians living in India? How, whose idea was that? Every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations. That's a, that's a fancy way of saying, I put them where they're living. I put them where they're living. I put this geopolitical map together. It is my plan. I have a purpose. And so all of a sudden, now I've elevated this idea of should you be aware of what's going on in the world? Yes or no? Why? Knowledge is one. Good choices is another. Why else? How about God's will? How about God doing stuff in the earth? How about God raising people in, in the Middle East to see Jesus in the middle of the night? Somebody say hallelujah. That's another area strategically we have to get much more tapped into. It's the missions and outreach idea around the world. We should know that the Chinese are being persecuted for their Christianity. Here's why. Because if the trend starts moving that way here, who should know in advance? If the trend starts moving like it's moving in China, I've got news for you. They censor those people. They give them social scores. They follow them around. They cut them out of business if they are Christian. And they actually tell them what they can and can't say. I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to wake you the heck up. Can you say amen? I ain't here to scare you because I ain't afraid of it. Because God has prepared it. He, he put the Bible in front of you so you would know what was coming, so you would be prepared for what was to come. It wasn't so you would be scared. How many of you are actually legitimately scared of opening the book of Revelation? Honestly. I hope you're not. I mean, thank you. Thank you. 
We needed one honest person for everybody else to say, okay, yeah, I'm a little scared reading that. Okay, good, because some of us are not. And so who should be pairing up? The ones that are scared with the ones that ain't. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. You don't have to have it all done. Jesus is the only one that can say he's done that. All of us are working it out and figuring it out, and we can help each other. And so if you're afraid of what you see in Revelation, you can't read it with an understanding without being fearful, somebody needs to help you with that. Because the worst thing that can happen to the body of Christ is it not see what's coming. How many of you believe that? That's what prophecy is for. Prophecy is to see what's coming and react to it. Now, maybe we're getting prophetic words that we ain't listening to, and we're surprised when stuff happens because we ain't prepared. And remember, we're not destroyed for lack of knowledge. Actually, just that alone. You read that scripture, it says, because you rejected it. What's happening is not that knowledge is not available. It's we're not pursuing it. And when we see it, we run away from it. Can anybody say, Pastor, that's good preaching? That's good preaching. (laughs) That's what's happening. You think I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of the truth, man. I got the Bible. I got God on my side. I'm not afraid of the truth. None of you should be afraid of the truth. Don't shrink back from what's really happening because you wish it wasn't. Actually charge forward. God wants us to be boldly engaging the truth because number one, he knows what's true. And number two, when we know what's true, we go free. Somebody say hallelujah. I'm free because I know the truth, not because I ignore it, because I don't want to talk about it, because that's just too nasty. That's part of the problem with the body of Christ. We are afraid to get into the mess because we think we live there. I don't need to live in the mess to know what the mess is. I I need to be wise about the mess so I don't live in the mess. And when I see the mess, I know how to fix the mess because there's messes in people's lives. And you... Amen. If you, you see them, wow, you're in a mess. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to see that. Wow, that's a real mess. That's a, that's a, that's a real mess. You really, hey, man, come here. She's in a mess. Look at that mess. That's a real, you know you're in a mess, girl. Do you know that if you stay in that mess, that mess going to mess you up because it's just a mess. Lord, have mercy on us. We're supposed to have the answer for that mess. And you know what? I don't care if you didn't do it right. It don't matter that you didn't do it right. If you know how to do it now, that person needs you to be bold about the fact you didn't do it right so that you can help them do it right. Can anybody say amen? It's not good enough that your inabilities to perfect things in your life keeps you from preaching the truth. You're still supposed to preach the truth. You are the example of why it's true, because you couldn't achieve it on your own. And so you and your failures can be a glory to God. Please, somebody say amen. In your failures, you become a glory to God. Once you get that in your head, man, you become a weapon against the devil because every time he says you failed, you say, yeah, I probably did, but Christ didn't, so I'm going to go on his side. I'm going to form that thing into a weapon. Do you know every failure in your life can be formed into a weapon against the devil? Every, every mistake you ever made can be formed into a weapon against him to show him he's the liar and he's the failure, but God sure is not. But that's the power with which we have to process through this, and that's why the church has to get tougher. That's why we have to learn to go the distance. That's why we have to learn to practice dealing with fear. Somebody say amen. amen. That's one of the spiritual disciplines that is really relevant right now. Because if you operate in fear, man, stuff's going to mess you up. So let me say hallelujah. That's why we got to disconnect. I'm not saying you stay in it, but you shouldn't be afraid of it. And yes, we have to be honest and say, I'm afraid. I'm concerned. I'm concerned. Okay, let's work on that. Amen? Did I finish this scripture? Ah, yes. Having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. He's saying, I know men. I put them where they're, they're supposed to be. I got this geopolitical thing on my mind. Do you know that? I mean, we, we can say, well, you know, we shouldn't be in... I, I'm sorry. 
I'm going to mess you up a little bit. God's in politics. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like, oh, I hate Hollywood. Well, we need God in Hollywood, too. Oh, but the schools are really a mess. Well, we need God there, too. Oh, my neighborhood is really a mess. Well, you're living there. So step it up, right? We're going to have to go the distance in the world because it's important that we do that. That they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him. What does groping look like? Is that a passive activity or is it an active one? Groping is active. I am pursuing God. I am not waiting for wisdom to just, just drop in my lap or for someone to put a meme out there that's going to give me everything I need to know. I am pursuing God. I am pursuing knowledge. I am pursuing the wisdom that he says we should have in order to then prosecute through this softness like a dove. It's positioning. It's knowledge. It's understanding. And those things are things you have to practice and you got to go long on. You have to decide, I'm going to build that muscle and it's going to take me a while. I'm going to learn to marathon. It's going to take me a while. Somebody say amen. We know that everywhere else but the church. I don't know why. We're like, man, it's got to be easy. It's got to be Sunday, Sunday message, and pastor gives me a good word, and I'm set for the week. I hope you're not there. I hope you're not there. I think this church has really come a long way, and we are pursuing God at a level I've not seen other churches do. And I want to pat you on the back because I believe that should be contagious. That, that's what you want. Do you, you want somebody to catch something from you? It should be your passion for God. It should be your love of the Word of God. It should be, man, I can't stop thinking and talking and loving my God. It should be your, your energy and your passion because you love God. That's what they should be catching. And in the midst of a world that's afraid and running and hiding in caves and doing all kinds of stuff, doesn't know what to do next, who should be the light? We should. But you got to do some work to get there. That they would, would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. You ain't going to have to look far. And that's the, that's the good stress. You know the difference between you stress and distress. If not, I'll tell you. What's you stress? You stress is, is working out so that you actually build a muscle. It's the, right kind of, it's the right kind of exertion. The body actually loves a certain level of stress. How many of you knew that? Sports people know that. It's like there's a certain level of stress that actually develops me. My lungs expand. My heart gets stronger. My muscles grow. Uh, uh, you know, my metabolism actually goes to a new level. I burn fat differently. The body is the great example, God's creation, that good stress actually builds you up. Your bones get stronger. All those things, we know it happens. There's good stress. And then there's clearly distress, worry, doubt, fear, typically emotional things that come in, certainly smoking and things like that that we do to damage our bodies. You know there's good stress and there's bad stress. And God wants us to use good stress. Somebody say amen. He wants us to develop things and he wants to put us through paces so that we actually develop good spiritual disciplines. And I'll show you some of those things. Acts 17, 28 says, for in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. That's why he wants to develop us, because he loves us, because we are his kids. Understand that many of the origins of, of uh, sports today came from combat. Why is that important? Because we, we, you know, we're playing games, but they came from the reality of life that said you had to develop skills because of war. Marathoners were running messages back and forth across enemy lines. Somebody say amen. Javeliners were throwing spears at the other guys. Um, horsemen were riding horses in either chariots or single horses, and they were waging war. That's what that was, and that's where many sports come from, martial arts. That came from flowers, right? Yep, 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 yep. Martial arts was just, we were going to plant flowers, and so it's gonna, we we're going to wax on, wax off. No, it was combative. It was because, right, it was because we had to fight. We had to fight. So don't be afraid of being trained to war. Don't be afraid that Christians need to train for war, for battle. Because when you need it, it needs to be there. Somebody say amen. amen. And yeah, there's some training we got to go through, and we got to be willing to go through it. we got to be willing to go through the motions and really deal and build those capabilities. And that is what God wants us to actually begin to focus on. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? 
Run in such a way that you may win. Man, maybe I should just stop there. Because I don't think y'all heard that. <laughs> I mean, what is God calling us to, what, what does he want us to train for? The win. The win. Amen. I mean, it couldn't be any plainer. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So the reason we should be playing to win is more important than the world's being playing to win. And we should, we should actually execute much more energy against it. It is then important that we have... This thing really gets at the fact that we have to have winning habits. We actually, actually have to go into a, a lifestyle that actually develops winning habits, and that's why going the distance becomes so important because this year in particular, we're going to try to develop some of those together. Everybody with us? Amen. We're going to go into some training, and we're going to do it together because we're going to need each other. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I know I'm giving you a lot of Scripture. Chapter 9, verse 26, and it says, Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached... Whoa! Whoa! I thought I was running a race of boxing. I thought I was just running a race. I thought I was just going to the gym and just sort of hacking around, right? He says, no. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that I, after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Oh, oh my God. Do you see it? He's saying, man, all those things that you've seen in the world that you watch happen. You train in yoga. You do all that. But are you training in the things that actually are eternal? And then, more importantly, are you putting your body and everything about you under subjection to winning in that environment? That's what he's saying. And then what a powerful thing. And he's talking, what I love about the contrast of this is he's talking about after I've preached to others. Do you know that preaching is a spiritual discipline? Do you know that? It is a, it is a, a, a spiritual weapon but it's a discipline. It's a thing that gets done, just like you were training for some, some winning some big contest. Preaching is actually something God wants us to do and prepare for. Amen. That's what he said. He was like, am I just doing it any old way? No. I'm actually preparing myself to be able to do it. Amen. Let me tell you something. I know. I know. And so we are developing skills. That's what the church is supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be developing skills. And you'll see why this matters in a minute. We're supposed to be not just showing up on Sunday willy-nilly and not reading our Bibles. Can you say amen? amen? You can throw a tomato at me later. It's okay. We're, we're, we're not just randomly coming together to do stuff. We're supposed to be training for winning. We're supposed to be going along and going the distance in our lives, not just relative to, you know, our financial lives. How about our spiritual lives? Our spiritual lives are supposed to be developing. I should be developing spiritual muscles. I should come in here and look better today, character-wise, than I did last week. Can anybody say amen? And we should be, hold, be holding each other accountable to that very thing. I want to see character develop in you. If I beat you up about how you're acting, is it because I'm just mad at you all the time? Probably not. I'm probably seeing a character trait that if you let it keep going, it's just going to wear you out and kill you eventually. And God, you're like, well, why can't God use me? Because your character sinks. I'll say it again. Fire for effect. Why isn't God using me or talking to me? Maybe your character stinks. Why can't I debate with people in a, in a way that they hear me? Maybe your character stinks. Maybe you're not good at it. Maybe you haven't developed that muscle. Maybe you don't love the people that you're talking to. There's so many ways that we can look for this thing. Come on now. That's what the Bible says. You're supposed to esteem others more highly than you do yourself. Somebody say hallelujah. Come on. This is all character development. God's trying to tell us this is how you bridge the gap. This is how you reach people. If you're going to preach to people, you need to esteem them more highly than you do yourself. Somebody say amen. You lift them up, not let them lift you up. You're getting all prideful about how you're talking to them and thinking you know everything, and then they're like, well, I don't like that because he's putting me below him. Instinctively. You know, people are smart as dogs, if not smarter. Just like they smell fear, they smell arrogance. 
They smell arrogance. And so our preaching is ineffective because we're, we can be arrogant. We can think we're all that. We can think, oh, I got I to gotta school you. Maybe not. Maybe not. But do you see how this plays and how we play? And how we conduct ourselves in what we do. Character is one of the, the most important things. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men. Yes, men are trying to manipulate you. By craftiness and deceitful scheming, media is trying to manipulate you. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. And then we go to Hebrews chapter 12, which again is, the, is, the, is part of the genesis of this teaching. And it says, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so e easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Can you say amen? Now, I'm guaranteeing you, if you came out of prayer and fasting, you have personal things God's talking to you about, but then we have them too as a church. And so that's why this is the vision part of this. We have to run a race this year. How many of you would say amen? amen. We get, we, as a church, we have to run a race this year. We have to win in some areas. And I'll share those with you briefly because they're in this book. And that's why this book is going to be so helpful. They're in this book. And I want you to understand them. But we got a race to run. I don't want to get to the end of this year and say, oh, God, I'm sorry, I missed it. And then go into prayer and fasting next year and have God chastise me and say, well, you missed it last year. What, 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 what assurance do I have you're going to get it this year? You know, that's true of us personally, too. When you don't listen to God, he stops talking to you. You ever notice that? When you don't listen to God, things happen in your life, and then you're cleaning up the consequences, regardless of whether he forgives you or not. And he forgives you instantly. you got some consequences to clean up. Can anybody say amen? amen. So don't get impatient with that because you did it. And we're like, well, God, how can't you? No. <laughs> I want you to learn, learn what you should have learned sometimes. Yeah. And so that is part of the character building. But it says, the sin was so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. There's so much here. Despising the shame and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let me talk about it relative to a couple things, one of which is the club of faith, because we believe that we are somewhat of the club of faith. It is the body of Christ that's the club of faith. But this cloud of witnesses that we're talking about is us. At some point, we have to become cheerleaders for one another. Would you say amen to that? Well, I got to know which race you're running in order to do that. I got to be in your life a little bit. I got to take this thing and I got to fill it. I got to really enter some of the questions that it asks about where I am in life. And I have to share that with some people. This is, this is a multiplayer game, okay? This is, this is, we're online and we're all connected up to the same Holy Spirit. And it's a multiplayer game and the Holy Spirit's trying to coordinate what's going on. Somebody say hallelujah for all you gamers out there. And you know you got to log in and you got to figure out what's going on in the game and you've got some partners you're playing this game with. That's part of what this is about. But it's that cloud of witnesses surrounding us. And so we want to walk this out together because that is the way we're going to be successful. And there are other elements to it, but that's one of the first ones I want to talk about. And it's a simple model that we're going to use this year because it is, it is, when you think about it, you get ready, you get set, you get going, and you get results. And so you will see in this guide, that is the way we're going to structure this year. And so we're going to encourage you to have goals starting out, but then we're going to encourage you to plan for winning at the end. Can you say amen? amen. And we believe that in order to do that, you got to get ready, get set, get going, and then get the right results. Every one of those big things that you have in front of you to achieve, you have to go through all four of those steps. Want me to prove it to you? Luke 14 28, it says, for which one of you, when he build, wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Can anybody say amen? If you think God is not interested in you having a good plan for the great thing he gave you, I'm here to tell you, you're wrong. If he gave you a mighty thing to do, do you know it behooves you to start planning for it? Somebody say amen. 
If God gave you a big challenge, do you know that you have to go through some steps like get ready, get set, get going, get results? You have to take it through some disciplined approach, and that's what this is about. We're going to do it as a church, and we're going to encourage you to do it individually as well. And so, again, we're lining up so that there's a personal part of this thing we're going to commit to, and there's also a body part of this thing we're going to commit to. But you should have, again, come out of this time with God with something he's put out there for you. But I'm going to encourage you, and we're going to encourage you to think about it. The get ready part, what does that look like? It's taking a hard look at where you are and what's going well and not so well. So if God's called me and he says, you know, I want you to engage strategic prayer in the church, i got to go through and say, well, what, what's going on now? What's happening now? Let me assess what's going on now. And then I have to go to the next step, which is I have to get set. I have to commit to moving in one or more of the areas that are identified. And so I have to think about, okay, well, what's it going to take to do strategic prayer? From me, okay? How do I need to get engaged that? So I'm going to do the get set. I'm going to get, get ready. I'm going to get set. And I'm going to align myself to the goal. I'm going to align myself to what it is God is telling me to do. Does that make sense? And then the next one is I got to get going. At some point during the year, I have to do something. I have to activate the faith by doing something. I have to say by building a regular set of actions toward those new goals, I'm actually going to achieve it. It's not going to happen. And so we have to back away from And some of us are good at this and some are not. This is where partnerships are going to be helpful. If you are not a good planner, in other words, you don't know how to stepwise figure out what it takes to get to your goal, what should you do? Inquire of your family, friends. Your family and friends and, and even your church people, right? right. Well, that's my family and friends. Amen. Hallelujah. I agree with that. So you might inquire of some people that are better at helping you plan. Somebody say amen. This is, a, this is a collaborative thing. And so if you've got a big goal, you want to write that big goal down, and you want to say, I came out of prayer and fasting, and here's what God told me to do individually, and there may be some connections to our church because I'm going to show you some things we're working on. And you want to use this journal to begin to help you guide that path. Again, you're going to get ready. You're going to assess yourself. You're going to get set. You're going to align yourself. You're going to get going. You're going to activate yourself. And then you're going to get results. And you're going to achieve those results that God wants you to achieve. Does that make sense? It's a simple model, but we're going to break it out in quarters this year. And so every quarter, we're going to come back and discuss, and, and you'll have an opportunity to share the goal that God gave you. We're asking you to write it in the journal so you're keeping track of some of those things. If you're doing it as a family, we encourage you to just say, let's get that goal together. Let's agree on what that goal statement is, and then we will help you through the year to march toward it. Does that make sense? Yeah. That is our vision for what this going the distance is going to look like. Now, what is going the distance? Well, it's achieving what God wants us to achieve. At this point, we have some goals, you have some goals, and we need to write them down so we achieve them. Everybody in agreement with that? So we achieve it. Now, at the end of the year, you may say, well, I didn't do anything toward that. Praise God, hallelujah, start over again, right? Start over again. If it was a big goal and it's still on your heart from God, then it will behoove you not to let go of it because God, his, those things are without repentance from God. How many of you have figured that out? Just like the gifts are without repentance, you know what? When he gives you a goal in your life and it's a God goal, it's not going away. It's not going away. You may not achieve it, but it's not going away. And God won't, he won't, he wasn't, he didn't get it wrong. He didn't get it wrong. Maybe you did. Amen. And so that last one is get results you achieve by sticking to it and evaluating your progress. Critical point. You stick to it and you evaluate your progress. You stick to it and you evaluate your progress. You stick to it and you evaluate your progress. If people in your life help you evaluate your progress, if you want to be a better dad, then set some goals. And set some goals and share those goals with your family. And then align yourself to those goals and say, here's what i got to do to achieve it. And then get going in it. Let me take some baby steps to start it. And then let them evaluate you at a certain point about how you're doing. You know, those things work. They work. And yes, I think some discipline in our lives, even in our relationships, would be helpful. How about you? So the prayer and fasting was to prepare your hearts, to give you some guidance and direction, to give you that big thing that God may have put out in front of you. It might be a small thing. Amen? How many people got a big thing? That that, that time really was like, mm, okay, I got some big stuff. I got some big things. And so if I'm going to be true to God's word in my life, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to honor his prophetic word in my life. I'm going to honor the fact that he took the time to speak to me because I took the time to listen. Then I need to, I need to shepherd that thing so that it gets where it needs to go. 
Remember uh, Gideon, because we're going to close with those commitments now. Remember Gideon, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. But Gideon was hiding. It was the, the Midianites were, were coming in. You know, that was the group that was going to be in power over the Israelites. And so as a result of that, everybody was preparing for the worst. This is a good story. Everybody was preparing for the worst. It was like, oh, my God, here's, here come the Midianites. We know how they operate. They're going to do some things. And there was this guy, Gideon, and he was doing the same thing. He was doing, um, preparing the wheat and the, the, the sustenance so that they couldn't take it. They couldn't actually take it all and eat it, and they would have nothing left. And in the midst of that, he was called by God to do something about it. He was called the valiant, valiant warrior. He was hiding. And he was called a valiant warrior. I'll just, I'll just read this part. The Lord looked at him and said, because he argued. Maybe I should read the whole thing. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Out of the blue. Then Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. He was a very encouraging individual, wasn't he? He had a positive outlook of what was going on. He was like, he's like, no, it's the end of the world. Where was God when, when, when we needed him? Why, why didn't he correct what was going on? Why didn't he stop it from happening? You see, you hear it? Why didn't you, right, why did you let that happen to us? I mean, you know, the Lord looked at him and said, go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? Yeah. That's going to leave a mark. Have I not sent you? Have I not sent you? You see, God, in the midst of any circumstance, if he gives you a word, you need to move out on that word, and you need to not worry about what else is going on. Can anybody say amen? That's all you need to know. All you need to know, I told you you're the guy. I want you to do this. You should take out of your head all of the calamity that's happened, all of what you think is going to go on. You need to focus on what I told you to do. Do you hear him saying that? After all of the complaints about how it's not perfect and it's not set up, it's not, it's not really right. You know what? Praise God. What we need to do is just know that God sent us. Can you say amen? That's all we need to do. And so now's the time where we would have personal and church commitments. And I want you to gravitate toward actually taking this book after this service and beginning to make those commitments known to your own heart and also think about places where we could use your help. Three things I'll call out. Number one is discipleship. Again, you won't take action on it today, but think about it. There are three planks of our strategy. One is discipleship, one is culture, and one is, one is community. On the discipleship note, it's go and make disciples. That one's pretty doggone clear. Not converts, disciples. Somebody say amen. amen. We are called to do that, and we are doing things, moving in that direction. We're starting a discipleship class. But it may be something you're like, no, nah, I need to help teach. Or I need to help teach families. Or I need to help teach kids. We desperately need you there. Culture. This loving one another thing. We are actually trying to build a culture of love within this church so that it's preference-free. It is not biased. Anybody, with, anybody can be here and love on us, and we can love on them. Somebody say amen. amen. It is not one skin color. Right? Amen? It's, it, is, it is diverse because what's, hap what's going to happen in the book of Revelation is diverse. And these people, all of us, come from every corner of God's humanity. And we should feel comfortable here. Somebody say amen. And so we have to build that. The other one is community. Because remember, people were added to them daily. The, the book of Acts, the church at Acts, people were added to their number daily. That's what you need to think about with community. Because in community, if we get it right, and we're going and making disciples, and we're actually in a culture where we love one another, and we're intimate, and we share, and we debate, and we can talk, and if we've got issues, we can talk across those different issues then the community will build itself because the Holy Spirit will inhabit that community. Can you say amen? See, with the division, the Holy Spirit's not into that. The Holy Spirit's not into racism. The Holy Spirit's not into division and political eating each other alive. The Holy Spirit doesn't like that. It's grieved by it. And so the Holy Spirit needs a place of peace and love and, uh, and, and unity in order to then inhabit and then grow it. Can you say hallelujah? That's our vision. 
This will grow when our hearts get right and we get focused on God's mission for raising people in the knowledge of God. Can you say amen? This will grow, but it has to have the precursors. It's got to have a place where people can come in that door. And I don't really care where you came from. I care where you think you're going to. That's what I care about and you should care about. Are we after God? Are we after his truth? Do we want to grow in the Lord? Do we want to step forward? Do we want to win? Do we want to win? And if we want to win, this is where we want to be. And when we get in focus that way, people will come here to win because they know we want to win. Can you say amen? amen? And that will manifest itself in so many different ways. It's a partnership that we want. And I'm going to close with offering simply because we wanted to leave offering to the end so that you would understand where we think we're going so that you can then say, well, maybe I want to give to different areas or maybe, you know, whatever. But we want to do that together. Because that is also a show of unity. So thank you again. We prayed and fasted as a show of unity to heaven. Can you say amen? That's why we did it. We did it because we said, God, we want to be the container that you can inhabit. And if we'll just do something simple together, one-hearted, maybe we'd be an example to the world of how people that actually differ on so many different things can actually do something together. They can actually say, you know what, I'm going to put aside all my differences with you, and I'm just going to go before the Lord and bend my knee with you, and we're going to pray together, and we're going to love each other in a way that we show the world that being divided is not going to end, end, end well. And more importantly, we're not going to let it be the reality in this nation. We're not. We don't need to let this be the reality in this nation. Can anybody say amen? Do you love this country enough to change it? Do you love this country enough to be true to it? Then there's only one way you're going to fix it, and it's going to be with the gospel and the Holy Spirit and your brothers and sisters. It's not going to happen any other way. You're not going to join a pack, and magically everything's going to work right. It's not going to happen. And if it does, it'll be because God formed that pack, not you. Somebody say amen. Because God said, here's what I want you to do. But you know what? I'd want us to be on the same page before that happened. So if you would, prepare for the offering this morning. You know we have three ways to do it. And you can even do it afterwards. But we want to do it together just, just to show God that, you know what? We're trying to be together. We're trying to do what you want us to do, God. We're trying. And this vision that we have that's going to take us through the year, we're going to develop it more, but we're going to go through get ready, get set, get going, get results. And we're going to put that big plan, personal and church, in front of you, God. And we're going to let you help us create, craft a plan to win. That's the way it's going to go. Is you ready for your offering this morning? Well, let's pray. Stand with me this morning. I hope you got something out of this this morning. Um, you know I love this country. I'm not ashamed of it. Because I think this is what God did. But we're here, and it's important that we help be the weather vanes and, and help it go where it needs to go under God. But we ain't going to help it if we're divided. We ain't going to help it if we look just like the world when they come in here. We ain't going to help. We ain't going to help if we won't look at reality and sort of have the conversations about what's really going on, where are the strongholds, what's coming at us. What can we do about it? If we can't have those conversations, we won't be powerful in the nation that we love, and we won't impact it the way we should. So we're going to have to stretch a little bit, but I believe God will build our character. He'll strengthen our church. He'll connect us to his kingdom purpose in this nation, and we'll actually achieve some results. Amen? So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can give to your kingdom, and we give into your kingdom because you have a bigger strategic goal that you want to get done. In our church, you want to get us to the place where we're getting results, where we're going the distance. We're not just failing halfway through. And if you, even if we do, there's somebody next to us that says, come on, man, you can make this. You can do this. Get back up. 
We need you. We're part of the club of faith. We're going to run this together. We're going to get there together, and we're going to pursue it. We're going to encourage each other. We're going to lift each other up, and in doing so, we're going to achieve it together. But God, we give into your kingdom knowing that you are the partner that we need. You're our, you're our heavenly father, but you're also our partner in this thing. God, open the way that the visions that you want would come to us that you would show us where we need to shore up our church and do things differently and in addition to what we've been doing, that you would grow the kingdom through us, that the kingdom and the church are connected. They're not separate. They have different functions and they build on each other so that we can actually do your will across our lives. So God, we thank you this morning. We thank you that you would allow us to be a part of what you're doing so that you can get it done in this earth because you want to use us. And just like you told Gideon, Hey, man, it's you. I called you. It's you. I, you're the one that I wanted you wanted to do it. And so you got to step up and be courageous and get it done. And we praise you and thank you and all agree with that prayer set. Come on, give them the glory this morning. Say hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to have a closing song. That was an awesome song. Who wrote that last song? Dude. That, come on. Dude. Beautiful. So they're all beautiful. Praise God. But that rocked my world. So praise God. Let's get, there's a closing song, so just hang out long enough to just enjoy the worship. No.